Dr. Jerry C. Hunter, Jr. is a native of Lancaster, South Carolina. He received an Associate of Arts degree from Wingate University. He also earned a bachelor's degree in business, a master's degree in counseling, and a second master's degree in business administration for Appalachian State University. Dr. Hunter received a PhD in educational administration from Duke University. Dr. Hunter has held a number of key administrative and teaching positions at Appalachian State University, Broward Community College, and the University of North Carolina at Wilmington. He has also received the Distinguished Alumni Award from both Appalachian State and Wingate University. The state of South Carolina has awarded Dr. Hunter the highest civilian honor, the Order of the Palmetto, in recognition of his achievements and contributions to the state. Since Dr. Hunter became president and professor of management at Charleston Southern University, enrollment has increased from 1,600 to 3,600. Alumni giving has increased by 500% and the endowment has quadrupled. Several new grad undergraduate and graduate academic programs and campus facilities have been also added during his tenure. Dr. Hunter is a nationally known leader and a keynote speaker in higher education. His passion is encouraging students to find God's will for their lives and setting goals to reach their full potential. Dr. Hunter is married to Sissy Hunter from Lancaster, South Carolina. They have two grown children in the medical profession and four grandchildren. Please give a warm welcome to Dr. Hunter. Well, good morning and welcome to our opening chapel. This is always a, a special uh, day for us, and I hope it will be a special day for you. We have a lot of exciting things we're going to do in the next three hours, so just hang on. <laughs> it will be fine. We've extended the hours in the cafeteria, and so we'll be fine. Those of you who were able to get in, in the chapel here, uh, we have 1,500 at least here. We have 600 in our new dining facility that is beautiful right across, and probably another 500 in the Whitfield Leadership Center. Uh, today we're going to have a very special uh, time in the university at our Legacy Society luncheon, and those of you who came in earlier, you will see that um, we have a nice presentation uh, at the vestibule for the founders of our school, some of the founders of the school for which this chapel is named, W. Norris and Nell People Lightsey. So pay attention to that uh, as you go out, students. And at this time, um, I'd like to welcome a lot of guests. And with that said about the uh, special unveiling, I'd like to at this time to um, recognize uh, and welcome uh, two generations uh, of the Lightsey family. And we're pleased today to welcome members of the Lightsey family. And if you would please stand and let us recognize you and give you applause, please stand. As the university has matured and matriculated into growth and uh, maturity, uh, some of the faculty here who have retired can remember when we didn't even have a chapel. And today we, we enjoy the chapel and we're so grateful to all of you for making this a possibility. Um, I'd also like to recognize some other special guests that may be in attendance. Our, and as I call your group, if you just stand up and hold your applause, and we'll give everybody applause in just a moment. Are any members of our board of trustees, former trustees, would you please stand? All right. Just please remain standing, and we'll recognize everyone with our Legacy Society members. Now, students, uh, you don't have to applaud right now. We're going to do it all one. Now, folks, this is what a legacy society means. It means that people, uh, in their wills and bequests, they leave something good for the future CHA students and the university. And I've all, always told each one of them, when you put Charleston Southern University in your will, you just added another 40 years to your life because no one ever dies who puts CSU in the will. <laughs> so that's the best way I know to extend life. 
Members of the Women's Council, if you are here, please stand. And the Women's Council this past year, I know I won't get it exactly right, but they raised millions, no, they raised thousands of dollars for student scholarships. So if any members of the council are here, please stand. Board of Visitors, uh, Board of Visitors members, if you're here, that you give at least $1,000 a year for student scholarships. And students, when you get your financial aid package, if it's not a federal, if it's not a state uh, grant or loan, these are the people that help us give you scholar and athletes. This is where your money comes from for athletic scholarship. Buccaneer board members, anyone here, members of our Buccaneer board, please stand. Okay, and then other alumni and guests, please stand up. Now we're going to give everybody a warm welcome. <laughs> Campus security is a priority at Charleston Southern University. I know you're observing a lot of um, protection today, and that's intentional. One thing we want to ask you to do, staff, faculty, coaches, and students, be sure to sign up for the book alert system. And you will receive alerts when something is going on. And if you will need information, we try to keep you aware. And the second thing is that we all need to do and be, we need to be vigilant. If you hear something at any time, any place, or you see something that looks unusual, Call this number and we will take charge and investigate it. So we're living in a world where we need to be very, very secure and we're trying to help you be secure. We're proud to say that uh, we have another record enrollment this year of 3,653 students. And let's give that to the students. And we have a growing problem, however. The females are taking over the enrollment. <laughs> but it doesn't seem to affect the young men that want to come here. So we have 60-40. And that's pretty consistent uh, with our past as well. Now, we all know that we have a goal. And you know what goals are. They're there are goals that you want to aim for, but we want to not only aim for a goal of 2020, we want to exceed that goal. Uh, what we do at CSU, if we're going to win the ball game, we're going to exceed winning the ball game. So we're going to exceed 20, uh, by 2020, we're going to exceed 4,000 students. Uh, as we speak, we are intentionally trying to increase our international student population. And when we reach the 4,000 students, we hope we'll have at least 10% of our student body uh, international students. Because most of our students, whether you realize it or not, if you work in industry, you're going to be working for an international company. And so it's good to learn the culture and the, the ways that other countries uh, operate their businesses while you're in school. Well, we have some really famous people here. And they're in the cafeteria with live streaming. Our 2015-16 Big South champions, our football champions, and if let's just give them a hand there in the other room. And I know most of you watched the game this weekend, and you know we're better known as Georgia Southern, but you know other than that. Uh, we all sent uh, an email to Mac Brown, who I know, he used to be a football coach where I work, and I uh, said, Mac, get a life. You know, there's Charleston Southern. And no, they're not wearing us out the first quarter. And he kept saying, whether well, they're going to wear them out the second and the third. I said, Mac, we're in the overtime and our guys are not worn out yet. So uh, that was a lot of fun, we're very proud of them. And also, the first at-large NCAA selection in CSU history was our men's golf team. Let's give them a big hand.
When I accepted the position of president of the Baptist College when I came to work here, uh, it was a joy. Many of the trustees were founding members of the university, and actually they were some of the original people who founded the university. And one of the things that uh, Mrs. Lightsey asked me, she said, now Dr. Hunter, that's the way she talked to me, she said, Dr. Hunter, I want you to promise me that whoever's heading this university, at every year at the beginning chapel, that they're going to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with everybody who will listen. I said, Miss Lightsey, you got my word on that. So that's why we make sure that everybody here uh, hears the gospel very clearly from a layman's point of view, not from a theological point of view, from a layman's point of view. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to have a good time with this. The founding principle of this university, as you will see on the podium, and we have it very few places, but you will see it, it's go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the world. Matthew 28, 19, and 20. Now since I have the Lightsey family here, I can't resist telling this story. We had just opened up the Lightsey Chapel, and we were trying to get some people to rent the chapel so we could make the bond payments, some of the bond payments. And so my associate, he was a gentleman that had actually been president of Carson Newman University and also Sanford, and he was helping out. And so someone called in and they wanted to rent the chapel for a fitness program. That sounds innocent enough, doesn't it? A fitness program, a wellness program. I mean, that's what we're all about at Charleston Southern. And so they said they wanted to do some commercials. And we said, fine, fitness, wellness, healthy lifestyle, that's what we're all about. Well, I get on my way home one night and I walk in the house and my phone is ringing. And Mrs. Lightsey is on the telephone. She says, oh, Dr. Hunter. Oh, Dr. Hunter, have you watched, you looked at Channel 5 tonight? I said, no, Miss Lightsey. Oh, Dr. Hunter, it just keeps coming on. And I said, well, what is it? She said, oh, I can't even describe it. Well, what we had done, we had rented the chapel to the, um, what do you call them, the, the people, the weight, what? Bodybuilders. Bodybuilders, and they were all women. <laughs> and you can imagine what they look like on television. And it was a Lightsey Chapel, and then they would parade across the front. And, uh, you know, they did not have much on. It was probably a very cold. And so we tried our best to buy the advertisement back. Oh, they said, oh, are people upset about it? We love that. We're not about to sell that. Are people watching it? I said, well, more than we had even anticipated. Oh, we wouldn't sell you that back for any price of money. So I just thought the Lightsey family would like that, and you know how Mrs. Lightsey would. She's very kind, but she just said, please do something, Dr. Hunter. Get those people off of the television in front of the Lightsey Chapel. <laughs> the mission of our university is to promote academic excellence in a Christian environment. Now, I want to believe that everybody comes to CSU to get an excellent education. Now, we didn't come to come to church. We came to get an excellent education, and then the value added is that we give it to you in a Christian environment. You know, to get the Christian environment would be wonderful, but I'm not sure how that would look on your diploma if you only had that. So when we give you both of that, that's what our faculty and our staff are very proud of. And our vision, as we define this in recent years, is to be a Christian university na nationally recognized for integrating faith and learning, leading, and serving. This is a wonderful vision. And I would say to you that how do we do that? It, it's very difficult. Just having the vision and the mission is, is, is kind of a, uh, a goal. It's a vision out front. But we take very much care 
in hiring people. When we hire people, first of all, we want them to have the credentials and experience. But once they pass that test, we're looking for this statement from each individual person, that they have had a personal experience with Jesus Christ. They've had, they have a personal relation, not that they belong to the Baptist church and all that stuff. That's a wonderful thing to do in the Methodist church and the Presbyterian, the Catholic. That's a, those are wonderful things. And their grandfather was a minister. That's all it good. We want to know about you. What, what's your personal experience with Jesus Christ? And I'll be frank with you, there's a lot of people that we shake hands with and say, God loves you, we love you, but we're probably going to keep looking until we find someone who has the credentials and who has a calling at this particular time in life that they want to work at this university. And that's, that, that embodies the coaches, the staff, and the faculty. And that's what we're trying to do. We're not perfect. You will find things that we don't do right, but I honestly do not believe it would be intentional if we are failing in some way. So that's what we call the Christian environment. Today's message is pretty straightforward. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we're going to look at uh, the Christian life today and see what it's all about. And those of you that may not be believers, and we welcome students at CSU of any faith, whether you're believers or not, we welcome you here because this is our mission field. And we want to share Christ's love with you. We want to share the gospel. So you're welcome here if you're not a believer. So today, believe it or not, you're going to hear the gospel. It's God's desire that all of us would have peace and purpose with Jesus Christ. In Romans 5, 1, the Bible says we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, those of you uh, that have one of these little booklets, I'm going to ask you to do this, and this will be amazing, amazing discovery. If you'll put your name in it and put today's date in your little book and keep it from now on, and I'm always getting someone email me and say, I still have my little track. And so put your name in it, take it to your dorm room, put it wherever you keep your keepsakes, and hold on to it. You never know when you're going to meet a friend who is seeking the gospel of Jesus Christ. I carry mine in my car, I carry mine in my billfold sometimes, because it, you never know when there's somebody that's interested in hearing the gospel. So my message goes through the little book today, generally. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but has everlasting life. John 10.10, 10, I have come that they may have life, and that they may have it more abundantly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this is our faith. This is our Christian faith right here. And I'm often faced with people that I encounter in the, the business world, in the world, and they don't have any faith. And I said, well, you have to start somewhere. And we start with the Bible. And if you don't believe the Bible, it's going to be hard for you to have the Christian faith. So the Bible is God's inspired word. We believe it's infallible. It has different interpretations in terms of how you read it for yourself. But this is what God's desire is, that we all would have peace in our hearts and purpose in our lives. You think about a purpose, the word purpose. If you get on an elevator, it's got 57 floors, and you don't know where you're going, what button are you going to push? Well, you could get off on any one of those 57 floors and you'd have no purpose for being on the elevator to start with. You might think that sometimes about your purpose in life. So God wants us to have purpose, and that's when we have peace with him. So what's the problem? If the gospel is clear, 
The Bible is infallible. It's God's holy word. The problem is started, it started with Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God by eating of the forbidden fruit in the Garden of Eden. At that time, according to the Bible, sin came into the world and separated people from God. You can look at the uh, illustration. Non-believers without God, and there's a, there's a gap there. There's a chasm there to the people that believe in God. And Isaiah 59, 2 says, it is, it is your sins that separate you from God. In Romans 3, 23, it says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we're all born in sin. But there's hope. God sends us a bridge. And that bridge is Jesus Christ, His Son. And according to John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's a lot of theories today, a lot of publications, a lot of writings that say there's all kinds of ways to go to God. But the Bible says the only way to God is through His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. Christ died for our sins, according to the Scripture. He was buried and He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. You see why it's important to get someone to believe the Bible? If you, if you don't get someone to believe the Bible, then anything you read or anyone you talk to is going to be of an opinion. So this is what the Scripture says. Now notice the two sections here, the mountain, one side, and the other side. You have the non-believers. Well, that bridge, how we move over to the believing side, is by accepting Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. So God has a plan, just like I'm a business professor, I teach strategic planning, we talk about change, we talk about strategies. So God has a strategy, He has a plan for salvation. But you know, we have a choice, just like Adam and Eve had a choice. God can have a good plan, and the Bible gives us the way to salvation, but you see, we have a choice. We can reject the plan. We can reject God's offer. Or we can accept it. Our prayer is that everyone who hears the gospel accepts the plan of salvation. So how do we do that? Hey, this is personal. This is a corporate. This is anything about corporate. This is personal we're talking about. Personally, we have to admit we are a sinner. We have to turn from our sins and repent. We have to believe that Jesus Christ died for us on the cross. And then he rose again and he's living today. Hey, that's our hope. When we have all these tragedies, we have all these threatening situations, whether there's health or job or school or, or anything we're facing, we've got hope because of our faith. And then we pray to invite Jesus Christ into our hearts to be our Lord and Savior. Now that's personal, you see. That hasn't got anything to do with my family was a good family and we all went to church every week and all that stuff. That's a good thing to do. But that has nothing to do with your personal salvation. So Romans 10, 9 says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? What does the Bible say? Let's all say it. You will be saved. You know, that's about as simple as you can put it. There's a prayer that we all like to hear people pray. It doesn't have to be verbatim. But it goes like this. Some of you, if you are not believers this morning and you want to accept Christ, here's a prayer that you might want to consider. Dear Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I ask for your forgiveness. I believe 
You died for my sins and rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and I invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Now here's what the Bible says in Romans 8, 39. There's no power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to, let me underscore that, separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. I mean, isn't that a wonderful faith that God wants us to have peace? He wants us to have salvation. He wants us to be in eternity with Him. He gives us a plan. We can accept it or reject it. And then the Bible promises no matter what happens to us, we have security. We have hope. That's our faith, ladies and gentlemen and students. That's our faith. When you hear faith, that's what we're talking about. That's the Christian faith. It's not complicated. And we hope everyone has that. So once we accept Christ, we want to do these things. We want to study our Bible. We want to pray. We want to have fellowship with believers and I would say non-believers. When I first came to work here, I went, into, went up on the mezzanine in the cafeteria and every day I would reserve. There's a group of people sitting on the right and a group of people sitting on the left downstairs. And the group on the right always had their Bibles. They were studying and praying. And the ones on the left were not. So I asked, I said, what, what is this that's going on down there in the cafeteria? They said, oh, these are the Christians. And these are the non-Christians. I said, well, if there's one thing I hope to do while I'm here at CSU, I want to see the people who are Christians sitting over there with the non-Christians. Because that's how we can share Christ. That's how you as students this past, well, the last few weeks, as I understand it, and I know the number's not right, but I'm going to make up a good number. I'm told that probably 75 students, because of our students and our faculty and our staff, 75 students have accepted Christ this year. How about that? Show love and concern for others, and that goes almost to getting a good grade, but not a real good, you know, not a grade unless you earn it. And then sharing the gospel with others. We're going to have two speakers today that I'm excited about, and they're going to talk about what a difference Christ has made in their lives. First one is DJ Curl. DJ, get on up here, son. DJ is a senior, and of course he does have curly hair. He's a Christian studies major. Uh, he's a strong safety. Now don't, don't let the size fool you. Just watch the defense on the football team and he's a head hunter. He's gonna catch the guy with the ball somehow or another. Uh, he's one of our outstanding Buccaneers. Let's give him a warm welcome. <laughs> I like, I like how he said headhunter. It was anything to get his name in there. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Uh, well, um, I'm going to start my story at about 10 years old. So 10 years old, I'm at a revival and uh, hear a pastor talking about hell. And he literally scared the hell out of me. And, I mean, no joking. I mean, I, it didn't matter what I had to pray. It didn't matter what I had to do. I just knew I didn't want to go to that place. So I prayed the prayer, asked Jesus into my heart, whatever, fill in the blank, I did it. And I kind of carried on that profession until I got to high school and you kind of see where the Christians start to separate. You know, you see, well, I saw like 
kind of like the weirdos, you know, the guys who didn't watch rated R movies and like were kind of socially awkward. And then you got like your your hypocrites, you know, the guys that are partying with you on Saturdays and leading worship on Sundays. I knew I didn't want to be that. That took way too much work to manage both. And then you just saw the third where it was, you know, I'll claim to be a Christian, but have fun. And I was like, well, yeah, I mean, everybody knows, most people know the Kenny Chesney song, everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to go now. And that was kind of the, uh, the way I lived my life for them. And I kind of carried that on throughout high school, really doing anything to bring myself glory. You know, I loved attention. I loved the satisfaction of people knowing that I was the center of attention and uh, started dabbling and stuff just because I had a really, really tough conviction from the Holy Spirit and he was on my heart. But it, I knew if like I would do certain things and maybe I would suppress that. And I ran from Christ, I ran from him. And I got to college, continued to do the same thing. And that's the thing you'll learn about here if you're new. If you wanna sin, you'll find a way to do it. If you wanna find Christ, you'll find a way. If you want to learn more about Christ, you'll find a way to do that. And we have staff that just, I can't even say the things that they've done for my just process of getting to know Christ more. But I ended up my sophomore year, kind of got to a point of just brokenness where for the first time in my life, I looked at myself in the mirror and I couldn't do anything to change the situation I was in. You know, I'm addicted to drugs, alcohol, a girlfriend, you know, I'm trying to be a better person. But what I didn't understand is I didn't have like a drug problem. I didn't have an alcohol problem. I didn't have a relationship problem. I had a heart problem. And I genuinely needed not only for God to come into my heart, but to give me a new heart, you know, and re totally regenerate me. And that's why like now I look back and I see that initial 10 year old profession. And that's why I'm not a big fan of scaring somebody into going to heaven because I don't think Heaven's a place where people go that don't want to go to hell. Heaven's a place for people that love Jesus Christ more than anything in the world and are willing to do anything for him in the world. And that's why now I live my life as a testimony of you don't need these things. And a relationship with God is not like, all right, God, here's my fun card. You know, I'll take the hit, live a boring life and then spend eternity with you. No, I echo the words of David when he says, you have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abounds. And they don't understand, some people will never understand, Christians in the room, the joy that Christ brings, the purpose like he talks about that Christ brings. But one day, you know, even the sufferings will pay off, you know? For I consider the sufferings of this present time not even worth comparing to the glory that's going to be revealed to us. And I got just one thing, man, if you're sleeping, if somebody's sleeping next to you, wake them up because this is something that the Lord's put on my heart. And I just, I really want to share a verse first, and that's Paul in Galatians 6, 14. He says, but far be it for me to boast except in the cross of Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. And you know, the things that is ironic is the things I thought I couldn't live without was actually the things holding me back from life itself. And what I want to proclaim to you is that good people don't spend eternity with God in heaven. Perfect people spend eternity with God in heaven. I'll explain that. I know it sounds weird, but like he was saying, you can be a teacher here and still spend eternity apart from God. You can go to a Christian school. You can be a Christian studies major. You can fund 400 orphans. You can fund this chapel and still spend eternity apart from God because it is only by the blood of Jesus Christ by which we are saved. I can't do enough stuff, I can't be enough stuff, but it's by Christ. And I just hold on to the, in Isaiah when it says, he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our sins. The punishment that brought me death was upon him, and by his wounds I am healed. So when I say perfect people go to heaven, why can I say that? It's because when I admit my brokenness, I turn away from my sin. I turn to Christ. He takes my brokenness. He takes my sin. He takes my guilt. And he gives me his righteousness. He gives me his freedom. So now when God sees me, he sees me as he sees Christ. Is that not a beautiful thing? Is that not something that we should tell people about? Yeah, I mean, yeah. And the crazy thing to me is, I mean, I sat through probably 10 of these things 
where the gospel in, I mean, 1 Corinthians says the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. So the same people, I could speak this gospel message, he could speak this gospel message, and it could speak life into somebody, but it could also be somebody sleeping in here that never even heard it. But it's not our job to save people. It's our job to proclaim that message and then pray that the Holy Spirit would regenerate that person. And so I really want to encourage y'all, if you're new, if you have questions, please, man, find a Christian that you know is devoutly living for the Lord and is just consumed with his love. Ask questions. If you are proclaiming to be a Christian, please live according to your calling. Live according to somebody who has proclaimed righteous, holy, because now I'm one of those weirdos. <laughs> but the thing is, you can call me a weirdo, but God calls me blessed. He calls me his child. He calls me holy. And I hold on to that. And it's for his glory that, that I'll live. Thank you. Hey, what a guy. Now, I don't know if you... I don't know if you have anybody that prays for you every day or not. Does anybody have somebody that prays for you every day? Well, let me tell you what. I got somebody that prays for me every day, and at the end of every football game, he comes and picks me up and throws me way up in the air, and that's his father, uh, ex-Marine, and you think he's tough. You ought to see his father. He comes out on the field. Dr. Hunter, I've been praying for you every day. I said, what are you praying for? Uh, he says that you'll share the gospel with everybody you see. Okay. Okay. Papa's proud of you, son. Proud of you. Maybe he won't throw me up so high this week. Okay, another guest we have, and this is really a treat, and what we're going to be ex experiencing here is how someone shares their faith in a public environment. It's, it's fairly easy to do that at CSU, but when you go in the public environment, how do you do that and not lose your job? How do you do, do that and not be ridiculed? And so we have here Dr. Glenda Levine, Chief HR Officer. Now students, the HR Officer is a human resource officer. That means the person that you apply for jobs. That's her job at Berkeley County School System. She's an undergraduate of Benedict College. She has her master's in educational administration from CSU and her doctorate from Nova University. She's been a teacher. She's been assistant principal at Stratford High School, big high school. She's been a principal at Hanahan High School right over here. She's presently the chief HR officer for Berkeley County Schools. Come on up, Glenda. Good morning. Good morning. It is an honor to be here with you today. And what Dr. Hunter said is very, very interesting um, in terms of the work that I do. Yes, I do work for a public school system, but I will tell you, I will tell anyone that people aren't very interested in what you have to say. They are interested in seeing what you actually do and whether what you do actually matches what you say. And that is what I endeavor to do in my position every day. I always laugh about it and say that sometimes, you know, people think human resources, well, hey, that's where bad things happen. If you see me walking into a building sometime, or if there are teachers who see me walk in, they say, oh my goodness, why is she here? Now, I want you to look at me now. Do I look like someone who would cause daunting thoughts to go through anyone's minds? Do you think? They should be happy to see me, correct? Well, guess what? It does not work like that sometimes, so I've made it a habit to go and visit and to go into buildings to say hello to folks and to make sure they understand that we are there to support and I have a team, it's not just me, and that's very important also, that you know that I'm not the one person who does it, but we have so many who do it all. Well, integrating faith in learning, leading, and serving, first of all, giving honor to God, 
to President Hunter and Mrs. Hunter, to the administration, faculty, staff, alumni, visitors, friends, and to the CSU student body. It's an honor to be with you this morning to celebrate the start of a new school year with opening convocation. It's always an honor to be here at Charleston Southern University where I had the privilege of working on my master's degree in education administration over 20 years ago. Today I thank God for Dr. Don Clerico, Dr. Martha Watson, Dr. Patricia Bauer, who were my professors in the School of Education when I attended CSU. You are still fortunate to have wonderful professors in the School of Education and also so many other departments here at CSU. I've enjoyed speaking with Dr. Melanie Murphy's classes over the years and several other classes in the School of Education. I've also enjoyed watching the growth that has taken place on campus and the achievement of awards, numerous national recognitions, the new schools of study and extensions of various academic areas, new facilities, building renovations, the community outreach that has been essential parts of CSU, opportunities to serve and study abroad, efforts to increase diversity, the growth of athletic programs, and I have to also add, that was an awesome game on Saturday evening, was it not? Absolutely awesome. And I have to say this um, as well. I've been told um, to just share a, just a word with, uh, with some of you that I have a feeling that that team is going to come around again, that certain other team that shall remain nameless. But this time, I think the score is going to be kind of reversed. That is what we're hoping for and what we will anticipate for the future. There are just so many things to be proud of at CSU, and from my perspective, it is clear that the successes experienced here are not coincidental. They are rooted in the vision, integrating faith in learning, leading, and serving. And that's what I'll be speaking with you briefly about this morning. Students, I have to tell you that you are not a student at CSU by chance. You are here because God has a good plan for your life, Jeremiah 29 and 11, and CSU is part of that plan. There is a legacy of excellence here at CSU that is rooted in the mission. For the past couple of weeks, I thought about what I would say to you today, and I noticed how many times I kept hearing the word faith over and over again as I had conversations with different individuals, as I watched different programs on televisions. Uh, there were just so many times that faith came up, and faith is such an integral part of what we do. Now, Merriam-Webster would tell us that faith is simply the strong belief or trust in someone or something, a belief in the existence of God, strong religious feelings or beliefs, a system of religious beliefs, but as I reflect on faith, the definition that has shown most significant in my life comes from Hebrews 11 and 1 from the King James Bible, which reads as follows. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. And then I have to go to Hebrews 11 and 6, which states, but without faith, it is impossible to please him for he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Students, you are here. We are all here for a purpose, and that purpose is wrapped in faith. As indicated in the vision, faith must be integrated in your learning, your leading, and your serving. Faith is essential to learning and to any challenges you will see in life. I know that faith is essential to learning. And I have to tell you just a short story of, about me and, and the history of what I've gone through. Now, how many of you would agree that calculus is a pretty challenging class overall? You agree with that? I saw a whole lot of nods on, on that, pretty challenging. Now, I went to a very small school in Greeleyville, South Carolina, C.E. Murray High School, where we didn't have a whole lot of variety when it came to classes. So I didn't get the opportunity to take calculus in high school. I got 
to what they would call pre-Cal back then, but remember now, we're talking almost 30 years ago. But guess what I did? Something that some people would say wasn't very smart. I went to college and majored in math. Now, did that take some faith? Do you think? It took a great deal of faith. It took also a great deal of studying. It took a great deal of praying. It took a great deal of preparation. And I have to, have to just say the sentiments that were expressed earlier. I have and had a praying mother. And I promise you that there were many prayers that went up. My mother is almost 90 years old, by the way. And till this day, I can still remember seeing her constantly, morning, night, lifting up prayers for me and for my brothers and for my sisters. So prayer is essential, and it's essential to learning. And I know that I made it through that challenge because of the prayers that were lifted, and I know that God was on my side. And when you know whose side you're leaning on, you know that you can make it. And students, I would encourage you to remember that as well. Faith is also essential to leading, whether you are a student, a teacher, professor, business leader, parent, etc. I know about faith in leading. As an educator going into year 25, I always had to incorporate faith into leading. There are so many people in today's society who want the position and the benefits that come with the leadership position, but do not want the, responsi the responsibility that comes with leading. Have any of you ever seen that? They want the, the accolades, they want to stand in front, but they don't want to make the sacrifice. Students, you have to be willing to make the sacrifice when it comes to leading. And remember, there are always people who are watching and your young people are watching you. Even if you say that you're not leading, I want you to also remember that integrity means doing the right thing even when no one is watching. C.S. Lewis. Faith is also essential to serving. Service is an interesting idea in today's society in which so much emphasis is placed on personal success and I, me, and my. You are blessed to be a part of a university that stresses the importance of paying it forward, a university that stresses the lessons I have learned in life. And thank you, Dr. Clerico, for emphasizing to our class some 20 some odd years ago the importance of serving and doing what he described to us as finding the cause beyond oneself. Serving is an honor, and it takes faith to serve. I pray God's blessings on you and all, and pray that we all develop an even greater understanding that we are all here for a purpose and that there is much work to be done. You are in the right place at the right time. And you will, I have no doubt, integrate faith in learning, leading, and serving. God bless you.